Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. We want to thank you all once again for joining in with us. We are so excited that you join us every Wednesday and every Sunday. Our scripture for tonight is 1 Chronicles 16, 29 through 34. And it reads, Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his presence. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let all the nations say the Lord reigns. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the fields and their crops burst with joy. Let the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He is faithful. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Our song tonight is Enter In, Enter In. Let us worship in this holy place. Enter in. Let us bow before his throne of grace. Enter in. Let's enter into the sanctuary of our hearts and give God a praise like never before. Enter in. <clears throat> enter in. Enter in. another honor, another great opportunity to come before you. We thank you, Father God, for this privilege of studying your word. Now, Father God, we ask you to bless us. We ask you, Father God, to have mercy on us. We pray, Father God, that you bless us 
for by forgiving us, first of all, for our sins. Forgive us for messing up, forgiving us for falling short. Forgive us, Lord, for not doing the things that are pleasing in your sight. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us through your word, that your word will fall on good soil, that lives will be made the better, that we will be better at 830 than we were at 7 o'clock. We pray, Father God, that we would take this word and tell men, women, boys, and girls about the goodness of Jesus. Now, Lord, we ask you to keep us now. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Yes, Lord. Enter in. Yes, bow before his holy throne of grace. Yes, Lord. and the amazing God Amen. and he has given us another chance another opportunity another blessing to come to worship together one more time <clears throat> our focus for tonight will be the end of chapter 3 Philippians chapter 3 is where we are tonight and we look to end this chapter and prepare for chapter 4 so we'll be in Philippians chapter 3 verses 17 through 21 Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21 is where we will be tonight. And we thank God for the privilege of coming before you and our, our destiny that's outside of the church. Amen. We uh, thank God from, for being able to come to you from uh, this remote location. And God is blessing us even though we're coming from a remote location. We thank God for the privilege of honoring him from all over the world. Yes. We thank those of you who are coming from Houston and those of you who are coming from other places throughout this nation and all out the world. We thank you for being a part of our service on tonight. We're looking at Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through verse 21. Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. Paul has already been talking. He's laid out the groundwork. He's talked well about those who are doing well in the church, those who are looking out for the kingdom of God. And then he talks much about those who are doing things that seem like they are for God, but they are not doing things for the glory of God. And so it, it, it tells us and reminds us, even in the world in which we live, we have those who are teaching and preaching and worshiping and singing for other reasons other than to the glory of God. So we come tonight to reveal what Paul says at the end of this chapter, chapter 3 of Philippians. We thank God for the privilege of you joining us by Facebook Live. We thank you for the privilege of joining us uh, by Zoom. We appreciate your coming and being a part of our service here on tonight. Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse number 17, the Apostle Paul says, Brethren, join me in following my example. And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Paul, we know here, is talking to Christians, those who love Jesus Christ, those who have, uh, who have received Jesus as their Savior. And we know that because he says brethren or brethren. He says, brethren, whatever you do, understand these things well. We want you to join us. We want you to join in with us in following the example that we have set before you. Note those who walk. Note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Paul talks about the fact to these, these Christians, these, these new, newly found saints at Philippi, he says to them, whatever you do, join me or join us. This phrase, join me or join us, means to follow, follow me, uh, come together and yoke with us together. So Paul says, 
And we need to understand that there are some examples before us. And if you were in my setting, I would ask you the question, do you know somebody who is a godly example that has set an example before you? And if it is, think on that person and follow them likewise. The problem today, we have Christians that are following people <laughs> that are not following Christ. We have Christians that are following people who are athletes, those who are entertainers, those who are, are, are those who are, are in the, the movie business. They are following them, but those who are not following Christ, you ought not follow them. Paul says, join, join in, join in following my example. Paul has said to them in the first, first three verse, the first three chapters, Paul has said, I have set a good example before you. Follow me as I follow Christ. He says here tonight in verse number 17, Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, he says, brethren, join me in following my example. I am setting an example before you. This word example means imitator. Mm -hmm. I am an imitator of Christ. Therefore, you ought to be an imitator of me. Right. I'm an example to you. I'm an example. And because I've been an example, you ought to follow my example. Right. He says, note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. First of all, he says, join in with me. Mm -hmm. Follow me. Follow my example. And then he says, then there are some that are among you that are noteworthy. He says, note them. This word note means to mark them, to take heed uh, of them. And also, whatever you do, to consider them. Take aim at them. Look at them. So Paul says to them, take note of them, meaning that you ought to take aim at them. In other words, you ought to aim to be as they are. You ought to aim to be as they are, so much so until you mock that man. In a different pericope, Paul talks about those who are not following Christ. You ought to mock that man. But in this example he gives here tonight in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, he says, mark those, note those who so walk and use those as a pattern. Anyone who sows that does some real sowing, I'm not talking about people that, that takes up a needle every now and then or put a machine in, in, in up and down with the needle every now and then. I'm not talking about that group of people. But anyone who knows some about sowing, anyone who knows and do some serious sowing, that person has a pattern. And when they have a pattern, they know in order for the material to come out right, in order for the finished product to fit right, to look right, they have to follow that pattern. Yes. Let me just tell you, people are following wrong patterns today. They are following and they are imitating wrong people today. Mm -hmm. Paul says, Paul says, whatever you do, be, be a imitator of me as I'm an imitator of Christ. And then he says, mark those who are walking as I've advised you to walk. Yes. This word walk doesn't mean that to put one foot in front of the other. This word walk means your lifestyle. He says to them, note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Mm -hmm. Paul says there's a group of us. In other words, it's not just me that you need to be following. You need to follow others also as a pattern. They have set forth a pattern before you. Let me just tell you, if you put the same ingredients in the cake, <laughs> every time the cake will come out the same every time. That's right. If you act like those who are not of God, you will turn out like they are every time. The problem is we got people who think it can't happen to them. So they do some things that they see other people doing because they have confronted this thought that they have prescribed to the thought that, that it won't ever happen to me. Mm -hmm. People do crazy stuff, breaking houses, and, and they come to the conclusion, I'll never get caught. But that's why they got a rap sheet right now, long a long rap sheet. People have come to the conclusion that I can handle my liquor. It won't affect me the way it affects you, but there are too many great men that have fallen behind the same thought. Yes. 
Some people have come to the conclusion that I can do drugs, I can do alcohol, just like nobody else can. I can handle this thing. And before, no, before they know anything, they, they started off trying to balance little monkeys and end up trying to balance King Kong. It's because if it happens to them, it can happen to you. The pattern is set. What goes up will come down. If you walk out in the middle of the street and a car can't stop, it's going to run over you. You can talk about whether it's your time to leave here or not. One thing about it, if it's not your time to leave, you are running a dangerous game, a dangerous gamble. Yeah, it may not be my time to leave, but the rest of my time on earth will be terribly miserable after I'm all broken up. So we need to make sure we note those who are walking in godliness. Walk, note those who are carrying themselves in the way God would have them to carry themselves and use us, use them as a pattern. Mm -hmm. I say to young girls and young boys all the time, if, if, if you're looking at two different persons headed in two different ways and they ended up doing two different things, one of them headed up broke, busted, ended up broke, busted, and disgusted, and the other one ended up with a, a well-balanced budget. I'm not talking about being rich. I just mean a well-balanced budget. Whatever pattern you follow, let me just share with you, you will end up where that person ended up because there's a pattern. Paul says that we have a pattern. This word pattern means a print. This word pattern means a manner. This word pattern is a stamp. It is a figure. It is a form. This word pattern means a fashion. It's a, it's a pattern. And we ought to have somebody in the church that we can follow as a godly pattern. We ought to be able to follow some people as godly patterns. So much so until we can years later talk about the pattern they set for me. I can recall growing up as a boy, the deacons, I always wanted to be a deacon. I didn't, I didn't want to have anything to do with preaching, but I always wanted to be a deacon because the patterns that were set in our church, the St. James Church uh, on 49 in Yanola, Mississippi, I saw deacons that walked uprightly before, before the Lord. I remember them even in my heart today. I remember Deacon John Chance. I remember Deacon Abbott Batwork. I remember Deacon uh, Dixon. I remember Deacon Singleton. I remember uh, uh, Deacon Lord. I remember these men, Deacon Turner. I remember these men walking uprightly before the Lord, and I wanted to be just like them because they presented before me a godly pattern. Amen. Let me tell you, there ought to be somebody in your life that you can look at, at as a godly pattern. And whatever, whatever road they took, Paul says, follow that road because they have set forth a manner, a print, a, a stamp, a figure, a form, and a fashion. It is a pattern. In verse number 18, Philippians chapter 3, he, he says, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. He says now, in verse 17, he says, follow these men who are godly men, who are brothers of the faith, follow the pattern that they have set before you. Amen. He says that, that if, if, if you have somebody that is godly before you, follow that pattern. Then he says in verse number 18, I've told you over and over and over again. The good thing about Paul, he sounds like the modern day preacher who says the same thing over and over and over again. And I say it over again. Sin will always take you further than you intended to go. Sin will make you stay than you expected to stay. And sin will always cost you more than you can afford to pay. Let me tell you, sin has a way of pulling us in, roping us in. We get to love sin. We get to act out with sin. We get to play with sin. And sin will always take us further than we intended to go. 
Always. It will always take us and lead us. We can't flirt with sin. We can't play with sin because sin will always take us farther than we intended to go. Sin will always make us stay lower than we intended to stay. I'm a living witness. Sin has a way of coercing you, caressing you, and always keeping you lower than you expected to stay. And finally, I can identify with this one too. Sin will always cost you more than you can afford to pay. Yes, it will. Sin. You can, you can joke with others. You can play around with it. You can act like sin doesn't have anything to do with you. Let me tell you, sin will mess you up. Yes, so Paul says over and over again, just like the preacher says over and over again in, in the local churches here today, he says, I have told you often, I have instructed you often that many walk in a way and I've told you now, I'm telling you now, they have walked in a way, and while I'm telling you, I'm weeping about it. I'm actually shedding tears, Paul says. He, he says that, that I am actually shedding tears. I am not only wailing, but I'm bewailing the situation. Paul says, I'm so concerned about you, the church at Philippi. I'm so concerned about you until I'm in tears. It breaks my heart. It brings me to tears and weeping when I tell you there are some that are enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember a while back I was doing a, a series on the book of Romans. And I had, as you, if you followed us any time, I take a long time to get through a book. <laughs> Because I think there's always meat on the bone that God is willing to reveal to us that you can't get it the first time you read over it. I was doing, I was doing this series on the book of Romans in Bible study. And during the week, I, I talked to a, a, a local pastor. And he said to me, well, you know, your church is never going to grow until you stop preaching that old foggy gospel. I said, Gospel? Old fogey? Do they go together? He said, yeah, you will never, you will never ever have your church grow the way my church has grown. Until you stop preaching that same old gospel that you've been preaching for the last 25 years. The gospel? The gospel of Jesus Christ? He said, yes. You, you need to understand, you need to preach some current events. You need to understand that you need to talk about what the internet is talking about. You need to talk about what the news is talking about. One thing he was right about, and that is, it is the preacher's responsibility to, to remind the people of what the news is saying, what the internet is saying. But it's never the preacher's responsibility to let the internet set the course for the gospel and take the place of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. In the midst of doing this, 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 this series on the book of Romans, the next Wednesday, the following Wednesday, I had made it to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. God has a way of always developing his series around the given time in a needed situation. Mm -hmm. Now, because this pastor was a more seasoned pastor, because he had more members following him, it could have really torn me up. But my, my salvation and my sanctification is firmly rooted in this gospel that he was talking about. He said, you need to stop preaching that stuff. You, you need to start talking about the thing. And I wanted to tell him so bad, but he's a little older, had been, been into this thing a little longer. And I wanted to respect him, so I did tell him. But what I really wanted to tell him is, you need to shut the doors if you're preaching anything other than the gospel. Yes. So then, that Wednesday night, verse 16 was on the agenda. Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God mm -hmm. unto salvation yes. to the Jew, then to the Greek. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. 
Paul says here in verse number 18, he says that there are some men who are preaching and I'm coming to you, church at Philippi, as I'm coming to you tonight, church at New Beginning, to let you know that you need to understand I'm coming to you weeping. I'm coming to you in tears. I'm coming to you all broken up because I'm concerned about the fact that there are some who are the enemies of the cross of Christ. He says that some, you see, the God, without the cross, there's no gospel. Without Jesus, there's no cross. Well, well, the cross would just be a simple little stick. The cross, when, whenever anybody else died on the cross, it was just another criminal dying on the cross. But Luke chapter 3, verses 30 to 33 declares, and through 34 declares that when they had come to the place of the skull, when they had come to the skull hill called Calvary, when they had come to the place of the skull, there they crucified him and the malefactors and the criminals, he means, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. But the one in the middle is made the is what made the cross such a such a devastating and such a rejoicing situation. Yeah, the one on the right, the one on the right theologians believe that he died from sin. The one on the left theologians believe he died in sin. But I guarantee the one in the middle died for sin. His name is Jesus. Paul says there are some people preaching this thing and teaching this thing, and they're not teaching nor preaching the cross of Jesus Christ. Back home, they would always tell the young preacher, if you get up and you call yourself preaching, and you do not go by the cross of Jesus Christ, you just said a speech, and it wasn't even a good speech, because it takes the cross of Christ to put the devil on the run. It takes the cross of Christ to make us whole. It takes the cross of Christ to save all mankind. Amen. Paul says these guys have become enemies. Enemies, adversaries. Enemies, satanic enemies. Enemies, fours. Enemies, hostile ones. Enemies, odious men. They have become enemies of the cross. This cross, this cross I'm talking about is just a pole. There's it's nothing special about it. It's a stake. It's, it's nothing special about wood stacked on top of wood, one pointed up and one pointed down. It's, it's just a stake. Mm -hmm. it, but it did become the exposure of the atoning atonement of Jesus Christ. It exposed death. It made sure that death itself was put on display. It was just a pole. It was just a stake. It was an exposure to death on that cross that day. It was an error. These men were erring. It was an error to the truth. But most of all, it was atoning our sins. The cross of Christ. Yeah, it was this Christ, the Christ of God. It was this Christ, the Messiah. This Christ, the anointed one. He died on the cross. Yes. Let me tell you, I can close the doors now. I can end my little message now. Simply because it's only because of the cross of Christ that we are who we are. Yes. That we're saved and we're going to heaven. That God has atoned us from our sins. That we, Jesus has become our substitute for all the sins that we ought to have been guilty and died from. But Jesus became our substitute. Paul said there are some men who have become enemies of the cross. And he continues in verse 19 and he says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is is in their shame who set their mind on earthly things. Let's look at what Paul says. Paul says these enemies of the cross, their end is destruction. 
I pray for my brother preacher. I pray for him who leads a group of people, who leads a, a, a large group of people, and he is an enemy of the cross. I pray for him. I pray for the people. Because if it had not been for the cross, it wouldn't be anything called church. It says that their end is destruction. Their end, this word end means final. Their final, their utmost, their results is destruction. Destruction is waste. Destruction is loss. Destruction is ruin. Destruction means to perish. It says their end is destruction. Their end is perishing. Their end is waste. Their end is lost. He says their God is their belly. <laughs> their God, their God, their deity is their belly. In one term, the belly is the abdomen, abdomen the abdomen the midriff but in another term this word this this word belly means their hearts their hearts the god that they serve their belly their 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 hearts are turned toward themselves they are selfish then he says whose glory is in their shame now, you know, everybody, regardless of what kind of sinner you are, you, you got something that you can gloat about. You, you got something that you call your dignity, you call your praise. You got something you can brag about. It's no different than, than, than anywhere else. When men, when men have become the enemy of the cross, they got stuff they can glory in. They got stuff they can gloat about. <laughs> Their, their dignity, their, this word glory means their dignity, their honor, and their praise. It is a disgrace. The word shame, it is a disgrace. Yes, these men who have turned their, themselves away from godliness, their belly, their hearts are turned toward unrighteousness. They glory in their shame. Not only that, he says, they set their minds on earthly things. Philippians chapter 3, that's verse number 19. He says, these men who have forsaken the cross, these men who have become enemies of the cross, and you don't have to be a preacher. You, you can be a, what you call a saint. You can, you can, you can be an ain't. You, you can be somebody who have not confessed Christ as your savior, you are an enemy to the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's go further. Philippians chapter three, verse number 20 is where we are now. For our citizenship is in heaven. He says these men, their minds, their hearts are focused on earthly things. They are focused on things down here. They have put their 401k before their God, before our God. They have put their savings account. They have put what they drive, what they eat, how they live before godliness. He says it's a shame. It's a shame that their minds are on earthly things. Verse 20 says, for our citizenship is in heaven. Yes. Our, our citizenship, our, 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 our citizenship. You know, I'm a citizen of these great United States of America. Mm -hmm. I'm glad, I'm proud to be a citizen of these great United States of America. But I don't believe that America is so great that I want to be here from now on. I am a citizen outside of this world. My citizenship is in heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My citizenship, my life, my livelihood. This word citizenship means conversation. My, and this word conversation means my community. This, this word citizenship means my living. I'm going to leave here one day. And now that my soul is saved, now that I know Jesus, it doesn't matter when I leave. 
I'm sending up timber every day. My citizenship is not of this world. He says my citizenship is in heaven. The word heaven is the sky. The word heaven is the elevation. The word heaven is the board of God. This word heaven is the air, it's the power, it is eternity. I'm on my way to eternity. I'm on my way to heaven. My citizenship is in heaven. This place is not my home. You might as well wear it like a, a loose garment down here. Because you're going to have to give up what you have down here if you're going to go to heaven. Matter of fact, you're going to have to give up what you have down here if you're going to hell. <laughs> You're going to have to give it up down here. I'm so glad my citizenship is in heaven. Amen. That's why we sing the song almost at every almost at every funeral as we march out the door. We sing this song. I'm going up yonder. I'm going up yonder. I'm going up yonder to meet the king. Let me tell you, I'm so glad I'm going up yonder. I have been fixed. I have been saved. I have been delivered. And we're going to see a little later how I got delivered. It says, for my citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the writer Paul says, Paul says that I eagerly, in other words, I can't wait. I'm so excited. It, we ought to be about heaven as we are about a lot of things. You, we ought to be about heaven like we ought to be about Sunday mornings and Wednesday night. Oh, Lord, I can't wait to get there. I can't wait to hear the word of God. I can't wait. You ought to wake up several times on Wednesday night. Woo, it, uh, on Tuesday night. Is it Wednesday yet? You ought to wake up several times on, on, on Saturday night. Is it time yet? You ought to be excited about getting along with the, the saints of God. You ought to be excited about going to church. You ought to be excited. The text says in Philippians chapter 3, verse number 20, that we are citizens of heaven for which we are also eagerly waiting. We ought to be excitedly waiting. We ought to be excited to wait, waiting to get to heaven for, for when we get to heaven, we will see our Savior. We're waiting eagerly for heaven. We're waiting waiting eagerly for our Savior. We're, we're waiting eagerly for the one who delivered us, the one who set us free. You see, if you were to tell the truth, you admit to the fact that, that you were lost in sin on your way to hell. But Jesus Christ set you free. And you could not set yourself free. You could not get out of the chains from the devil. You were on your way to hell. You were you had a death sentence with a one-way ticket to hell. But Jesus came along. Jesus, the name above every name. Jesus, Jehovah saves is what it means. Jehovah saved. Jesus came along and he delivered me. The word saved it means he's 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 my deliverer. And Paul says, right there in verse number 20, he says, my Savior, my Savior, my, my Master, my Savior, my Deliverer. And then he says, my Lord. You see, you can be saved, but have not surrendered to Jesus as your Lord. Mm -hmm. So he's my Savior, but when he becomes my Lord, he's the one that tells me what to do. He's my Master. He is my supreme authority. He, he is my controller. He is the one who has the title of respect, my Lord. He's my Lord, my Lord Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Thank God for Jesus the Christ. Verse 21, Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, he says, Who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Yeah, he says that he will transform our lowly body. He will transform. This word transform, I'm reminded of transformers. 
the transformer that children play with. It, it could be rolling across the floor of the car and all of a sudden the button is pushed and it'll stand up and begin to walk like a man, a transformer. Yes, I, I, I am so glad that, that this lowly body, this word lowly body, this word lowly means vile. This depressed body, this body of low estate. Matter of fact, he goes on to identify this lowly body as a humiliated body. A body of humiliation. humiliation. This vile body. One of these days, he's going to transform this vile body to never go back to his form again, this form again. We will be transformed, this humiliated body, this word body means slave. We will be transformed, we'll be changed, we'll be made over again. The Apostle Paul picks this thought up again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, he says, we will be changed. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, in, in, this, in, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We will be transformed. Amen. Thank God he's going to transform us. He says, our lowly body. Then he says, conform. Who will transform our lowly body? He will change our vile bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body. In this one verse, he uses the word body and uses it from two different angles. First of all, the word body, meaning the slave, is the same word both places. But what happens here is he, he uses our body as a depressed body, our vile body, our lowly body first. Then he comes back and says, we will be transformed, conformed to his glorious body. Amen. So when he talks about body here, he's talking about the glorious body. And this word conform means to be fashioned, means to be similar to, means to be morphed. It means to be adjusted. So he's going to adjust our lowly body so we can have and be similar to where we can have the morphed, morphed, morphism where we can be adjusted to his glorious body. Word glorious mean dignified, honorable praiseworthy and, and a worship worthy body. So this, this foul body, this depressed body will be conformed to his glorious body. Yes, because I, I received Jesus as my savior, I have justification, so I'm saved from the penalty of sin. Because I have received Jesus Christ as my Savior, I ought to walk in sanctification, meaning that I am saved from the power of sin. But here he talks about we will be conformed to a glorious body just as his body. Matter of fact, conformed to his body, meaning that we will be glorified. We will have glorified body. The word glorious means to a dignified body. The word glorious means an honorable body. It means we will have a body like his. His body is a body that is praiseworthy and worship worthy. Amen. It is a godly body. It is Jesus' body. Then he says, accordingly, to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. He says accordingly. This word accordingly denotes that there will always be some opposition. There will always be some intention and some tension pushing against you. Paul talks about this when he, he talks about in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he talks about the fact that our bodies are groaning. 
He says, when this earthly tabernacle is dissolved down here, we have another body. A body that's not made by hand. A body eternal in heaven. He says that there will come a day that this earthly body will dissolve down here. Matter of fact, he classifies this body as a tabernacle, which means in the original Greek, it's just a tent. I'm trying to tell you, because you have sickness in your body, your tent is giving away. It's, it rains in the tent. It, it, it clouds in the tent. It, it snows in the tent. Uh, uh, sickness get in the tent. Uh, uh, sores get in the tent. We just have a tent down here. But one of these days, God is going to conform our body to a glorious body, just like the body of Jesus Christ. I don't know how he looks, but I do know one thing. We're going to look like him. We're going to have a glorified body. We're going to have a changed body. We're going to have a conformed body on the other side. He says, accordingly to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. I told you this word accordingly means that there will be some opposition. There's always opposition. If you're going to do anything when it comes to the Lord, there will always be some opposition. The word working, this word working means operation. This word working means strong. This word working means energy. Able, the word able means that that there is a great possibility, there's great power. You know, there may be some power on earth that, that we depend on, but there ought not be any power that we depend on more than we depend on the power of the conquering king of Calvary himself. Yes. It says that Jesus is able to subdue it, even though there's opposition even though the grave tries to keep him there, he, the, the grave couldn't keep him. Even though death tried to chain him and keep him, death can, could not hold him. The Bible says right here in Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21, Philippians chapter 3, 17 through 21, it says that Jesus has the power. Jesus has the possibility. Jesus has the strength. He has the power to subdue it, meaning that everything has to submit to Jesus. Subdue all things to himself. Everything has to submit to Jesus. I want to say to you today, if you've never received Jesus Christ, now is a good time to submit to him. Now is a good time to trust Jesus as your personal savior. Now is a good time to give up this foul body, this vile body, this body that we do any and everything with, this body that has caused us to be an enemy of the cross. It's time to give it up now. When we live in a life with COVID-19, we don't know when we're going to leave here. People are trying to get it right now. They're trying to get it right. They're trying to get it right. And I don't blame you. It's time to get it right. Yeah, it's time to get it right. It's time to, to do the right thing. It's, and the right thing now is to get it right with Jesus. And the only way, and the only way you can get it right with Jesus is come to know Jesus as your personal Savior. It's not a hard task. It's not something that, that you can't do. But I will say you can't do it on your own. You got to give it to Jesus. Just believing the story, the death, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can get to know him today. You can get to be a part of this great resurrection, conforming this great glorifying moment if you just get to know him. All of your troubles, he can handle them. But I do know one thing. Jesus the Christ is calling you. Jesus is inviting you to get to know him. Jesus is saying, don't continue to be an enemy of the cross of Christ. He's saying you can get to know him right now. 
the way you can get to know him and just trust the story that Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried in a borrowed tomb, and that he rose early that third day morning from the dead. The Bible says if you believe this story, according to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, if you believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can be saved right here, right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5 declares that Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose, and Jesus was seen. And it's that story that can qualify you to go to heaven. I know you've done wrong. I have also. I know things have come in your mind that you had to push aside. But the Bible says that if you trust Jesus as your Savior, when you die, you can go to heaven. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to get to know him. If you want to get to know him right now, just bow your head with me and you can get to know him. Just invite Jesus into your life to be your personal Lord and personal Savior. The door is open. You can tell him, Jesus, I believe the story. And I believe that story can get me to heaven. Just, just join me in prayer right now. I just want you to bow your head. Repeat after me this simple prayer and invite Jesus into your heart. Would you bow with me today? Repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe if you, that if you prayed that prayer and trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're born again. You're saved. You have justification. You have salvation. You're on your way to heaven whenever you leave here. The door of the church is still open. And if you don't have a church home, are you in between church homes? I recommend this one. Jesus the Christ is the center of attention at the New Beginning Church. I recommend this church, New Beginning Church, where Jesus is the main attraction. I recommend the New Beginning Church where you can come and fellowship with brothers and sisters just like you. It's not a perfect church. We're not a perfect people. But we believe the story that Jesus died for our sins and have made us different. If you've received Jesus tonight by inviting him into your life, why don't you just inbox me and let me know that you've trusted Jesus as your Savior. If you want to join this church and you've chosen to make that decision tonight, inbox me and let me know that you want to be a brand new member at the New Beginning Church. And we will welcome you in. And we'll be glad to have you. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight at the New Beginning Church at our remote location. Thank you for being a part of our service. And now as we transition, we transition to the period that it is offering time. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord. It is time to give to the Lord. It is an opportunity to give to the righteous king of God. If you're here today and, and you've been blessing our church, I want to say thank you. If you've been mailing in your offering, been mailing in your tithes, and many of you have, I just want to say thank you. If you're here today and you've been mailing in or using the cash app to send your tithes and offering, thank you. God bless you. I want to say to those of you who have not been doing that, this is your opportunity to give to the New Beginning Church. As you can see, 
on your screen, there's a Cash App in the P.O. Box. You can send your Cash App contributions to Cash Tag NBC Souls. Cash Tag NBC Souls. And if you're one of those who love to mail your offering in, you can do so during this pandemic era to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Please mail your offering, your tithes and your offerings to the New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. And because you have come tonight to worship with us, you can continue to do so. Our children have Sunday school on Sunday morning by way of Kahoot and our adults Sunday school class, which anybody can attend as we are on the air, at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning, our adult Sunday school class. And then our worship service on our live broadcast at 10.45 a.m. every Sunday. And on Wednesday night, we have Sunday school, Bible study rather, we have Bible study at 7.20 p.m., which is what you are in on right now. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. We enjoyed having you with us tonight. Please feel free to, to inbox us and let us know how you enjoyed our service on today. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. I just want to say to you tonight that we are, are not at our usual location because we are we're very sensitive to the safety of the people who attend the New Beginning Church. And I thank you for allowing technology to be a part of your life, to, to be a part of your worship experience. God has elevated us to technology in the right time, the right generation, where now we are getting the word out through thousands and some million people all over the world. And thank you for being a part of that. And as we progress slowly to go back in our church, we'll let you know as we do that. But for this given time, God has prepared us for such a time like this, for our worship together by way of online broadcast. Thank you again for joining us. Be a part of our service, and please continue to do so. Let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you. God, we bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for this Bible study. We thank you, Father, that we are not enemies of the cross, yes, Jesus. that we are supporters of the cross of Jesus Christ. I pray for every person in my hearing. I ask you to continue to bless them, walk with them, bless their families, keep them safe and secure. And Lord, that you will keep the glory, yes, right. all the honor and all the praise. And allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Thank you again. God bless you. God keep you. Is our prayer. Please continue to pray for us and we will pray for you. Amen. And thank the Lord.